and welcome to the Moonshots Podcast. It's episode 201. I'm your co-host, Mike Parsons, and as always, I'm joined by Mark Pearson Freeland. Good morning, Mark. Good morning, Mike. I mean, look, we couldn't be starting the big 200th onwards between 200 and 300 with a better series than today in episode 201, could we? This is one way to usher in a new uh, century of moonshots. And Mark, I think this goes to the heart of most moonshotters. This goes to the heart, I think, of what a lot of us are doing with regards to being entrepreneurs, being business leaders, or even just being part of a great team. And that's about achieving your goals. And today, listeners and members, we're diving into show 201 with John Doerr's Measure What Matters, how uh, Google, Bono, and the Gates Foundation rock the world with OKRs. Yeah. And I think a lot of our listeners probably have heard of this famous acronym, OKRs. But the question is, what the hell is it? Why is everyone talking about it? Why are so many successful people using it? And what is this whole thing about, Mark? How have you found putting your mind into OKRs and the work of John Doerr? What do you think uh, our listeners should be ready for? I think listeners, you should be ready to perhaps learn a little bit more about what OKRs or better said or easier said objectives and key results really mean and how they matter to brands. John Doerr has a huge amount of experience working with some of the biggest companies in the world. In specifically in the book, he calls out growth behind Intel, Google, Amazon, and Uber for, you know, somewhat successful brands, I would say. And they've, <laughs> they've all utilized this uh, methodology framework of movement of OKRs to achieve great growth. And I think that all of us are going to learn uh, new ways of considering as well as utilizing OKRs to go out and, and set goals and maybe achieve the results that we're all dreaming of. Yeah. And I recently helped uh, a company install OKRs in a team of about 40 people and they hadn't had OKRs before and it was transformational. I really cannot uh, emphasize to you and to our listeners how powerful setting objectives and key results really can be, particularly if you build it out of the vision that the team or the company or the business has, that it really gives such clarity on how the mission and the purpose and the values that you have, what they look like as things I do in the next 90 days. Mm. And it transforms not only the individual having their own personal OKRs, it transforms how they interact with their manager, how they interact with their peers. It becomes a, a huge clarifying, simplifying practice of knowing what you need to do, what's a priority, what really matters. And if you all get on the same page with your OKRs, everybody starts to feel more satisfied, more fulfilled in their work. It's easier to tackle problems of alignment and collaboration because you have a universal language. Mark, I think this book, Measure What Matters by John Doerr, I think OKRs, which are inside of this book, are a tool to sort it out in your team, in your group of collaborators, in your business. I think we should jump into this world and make sure that we set the right objectives and we're measuring the key results. Well, I think the only person that could follow and build on what you've just summarized and put into words, Mike, is John Doerr, the author himself, introducing the book, Measure What Matters, and helping all of us understand the value of setting goals. I came to Silicon Valley with uh, $50 in my pocket, no job, no place to live. I wanted to work in the computer industry and someday to start my own company. So I figured I'd apprentice myself to a venture capital firm and I met lots of them. And guess what? They all turned me down. But one of them said, we've just backed this company in Santa Clara by the name of Intel. You should check it out. 
As a summer intern, somehow I was admitted to a course on Intel's philosophies taught by resident professor and CEO Andy Grove. And he said, you know, it almost doesn't matter what you know. What matters is how you execute. And so Andy developed a system for setting goals called OKRs that led to excellent execution. OKRs are objectives, that's the O, and key results, the KRs. And objectives are what it is you're trying to get accomplished. The key results are how we're going to get that done. OKRs are important because how you set goals makes all the difference. They're kind of a vaccine against fuzzy thinking and fuzzy execution. Measure What Matters is not a textbook. It's more of a handbook. It's a field guide, uh, chock full of a dozen different colorful stories about entrepreneurs and big time executives, for profit organizations, nonprofits, all struggling to achieve excellence by doing a better job of setting their goals. This is a book for folks who care about teams, individual team contributors, and the leaders of those teams. I've written it with the hope that it'll be truly useful and allow your team to do more than anyone ever thought possible. No more fuzzy. I can't tell you how many times in my career I've been in teams and we're running around going, what the hell are we doing? What the hell are they doing? Do you know this is so frustrating? Why are they doing that? It's all of those situations that you confront where there is a a chunk of fuzzy. And Mm. I think like if you want to get the fuzzy out of your team, out of your business, I think OKRs are a great place to start. But I think there's a, there was another idea there, Mark, which we've heard a lot and I don't want to be too like jumping around here, but you'll remember in the Einstein series, he kind of said something similar. Like it wasn't so much about inspiration. Mm. Einstein said, I just thought about that same problem more than anyone else, i.e. he executed, he was very focused. And this is a huge meta pattern that we've seen in all the superstars that we've studied, all the authors, the experts, the entrepreneurs, that they have this enormous strength to focus on execution Mm. And not just having a good idea. It's almost like have a good idea, but execute with greatness, right? Execute with determination. And I think that this is a fascinating thing. It's like get the job done and how do you do it? Clear objectives and Mm. results. What do you think? Yeah, exactly. With the Einstein quote, uh, I I believe that's attributed to him is genius is 1% talent and 99% hard work. Yeah. (laughs) So this idea of execution and a propensity towards action, I think is something that really stands out a lot in the uh, series and the individuals that we're, we're diving into on the Moonshot show. And I think what this demonstrates to me is this drive towards having, you know, a growth mindset and being open to maybe learning new ideas, new frameworks, new techniques, but also the next stage, which is actually following through with them. So putting them into action, seeing whether they work. And this idea of removing the fuzz I think how John Doerr describes it is a vaccine against the fuzz. You know, let's let's find (laughs) something that brings clarity. You know, that's, that's ultimately what he's making the case for here, isn't it? Remove that fuzz, have a clear goal in mind. And that journey is then up to you to follow. And once you start putting, let's say one foot in front of the other or executing a plan or a series of objectives with a team, you then start to see change. And Mm. without actually putting, uh, you know, foot to pavement, so to speak, and without following through with the action and instead just maybe living with a load of models, frameworks, uh, uh, JIRA boards that Mm. you then kind of occasionally you might build, you might spend Mm. a couple of weeks maybe building it out. But unless you continually refer back to them, work on them, refine them, optimize as well as repeat, what's the point? And I think John Doerr's making the case there and similar to Albert Einstein, your intention is great, but unless you actually put it into action and go out and do it, then, then what's the point? 
Yeah, exactly. So, so here's the funny thing. Like we've talked about this largely in a frame of being in a team, being at work, working on a project. But the crazy thing is this applies equally to your personal life. And I think the thing that really ties them together, your professional and personal lives is that not only is it about doing the hard work, um, not everything happens perfectly the first time around. I think that it is a continuous process of improvement, a mm. continuous process of learning. I mean, that's Mark, that's why we have created the entire show, this continuous theme of evolution, improvement, refining, growing, understanding, and it works equally on your personal life as it does in your professional life. And mm. the great thing is we now can listen to John Doe talking about why setting the right goals matters not only in the business, but at at home as well. What's crucial is uh, choosing the right audacious goals for the right reasons. And I think there's never been a more important time for that than now. Let me tell you what OKRs are. Well, first, it's a kind of geeky acronym, but what it stands for is objectives and key results. Objectives are what you want to have accomplished, and key results are how you're going to get it done. It's a deceptively simple goal-setting system that was invented by Andy Grove in the 1970s to uh, help make Intel the best-run technology company of of his or, or, or maybe any era. He was a superb CEO and also a teacher. And so when I first you know, came to Intel, Andy said to me, John... You know, it almost doesn't matter what you know. And that's because execution is what matters most. And so he invented this amazing system for execution and valued far more highly than anything else results. Did you get your key results done or not done? Did you achieve the objective? OKRs pioneered at Intel. Uh, Subsequently, I took them to maybe a hundred different organizations. I introduced them to Larry Page and Sergey Brin when they were 24 years old in their garage as co-founders of of Google. I showed them the system and uh, Sergey Brin agreed to enthusiastically adopt them. Well, not quite. (laughs) What he actually said was, we don't have any other way to manage the company, so I guess we'll give this a try. (laughs) And I took that as a ringing endorsement. But here's the point. Every quarter since then, every Googler has written down her objectives and key results. They've graded them, and then they've published them for everybody in the organization to see. So 70,000 Googlers are doing that this quarter. Then, quite remarkably, they take these objectives and key results and put them aside. They don't count for bonuses. They don't count for promotions. They serve a higher purpose. They're a kind of collective commitment, a a social contract to what's important, what what really matters the most. Uh, in, in the words of the founders, they can't imagine running Google without them. I dream that they will affect our schools, perhaps our hospitals, even our governments. OKRs can make a difference on the personal front. Uh, I had a, a goal not so many years ago. It was something about getting more uh, intimacy in our family. My real motive was to make sure that uh, the girls grew up strong-willed, independent, and happy. And I I read and believed that having dinner together as a family would make a difference. So my key result was to be home for dinner 20 nights a month by 6 p.m. and to be fully present, which meant actually we had to turn off the router. You know, the the smartphones wouldn't work. And that, I want you to know, was a tough goal to achieve. I I probably hit it 70 percent of the time. I'd like the readers of this book to ask the following questions. Do you have the right metrics and goals in your life? Do you have goals in your life? What are your values, your objectives, and your key results? Mike, this is John, again, making the case not only with OKRs being a northern star, a guiding light, a way of removing that fuzz and bringing in transparency for businesses, as well as the personal life. I mean, this is already sparking a few ideas in my brain as to how not only I set goals with my work, but also 
about how I want to function, whether it's fitness, whether it's spending time with family, whether it's Mm. just spending time with me, you know, it's showing how broad as well as uh, flexible the idea of OKRs can be depending on how you want to implement them into your life. What, what's sparking in your brain as you hear from John Dorda? Uh, I just, <laughs> I just thought it was so neat that somebody who is not only a great author, I think um, what we have to realize that he is actually the chairman of the venture capital firm Kleiner Perkins. Kleiner Perkins is like one of the greatest venture capital firms on the planet. <laughs> And check this out. He is talking about OKRs relative to being home for dinner with his family. Yes. I just love the fact that he is not completely down the rabbit hole of work, 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 work. Mm. But he's like, no, this thing is, this is making sure I'm a better dad, right? So Mm. this is, this is a company that obviously invested in. Intuit, uh, Google, uh, Uber, Twitter. I mean, their their pedigree in tech is amazing. But hey, this is a system that works in those companies, and it can work in your home too. And I think that's the the gift of getting clear on your objectives. What are you going to do? Results? How are you going to get there? This is a really powerful one, two punch. And Mark, we're going to go deep, deep, deep into this world over the course of this show. And I think if I was setting an objective, I want you to think, Mark, I want you to think of an objective that we could maybe give uh, to our wonderful, our thriving global audience in all four corners of the planet. If the objective was to build the Moonshots community and to spread the word, what would be a key result that they could actually nominate? Well, in this instance, Mike, it's something as simple as uh, opening up your podcast app of choice. Let's say it's Spotify. Let's say it's Apple Podcast. And navigating over to the Moonshots podcast and leaving a rating or a review. And this really makes a huge difference. It helps us get the Moonshots message as well as what we're doing every week, Mike, bearing in mind it's show 201. We're learning out loud. We're digging into the realms of OKRs today. Last week was John F. Kennedy and the leadership lessons that he had around the Cuban Missile Crisis. Mm. We're, We're going pretty broad and it's amazing that every single I would say day, we can find a new source of inspiration for the Moonshots family. But it's all up to you, our listeners, to help us share the good vibes and the lessons that we're learning. And that's as simple as leaving a rating or review to help us be heard in faraway lands throughout the globe. I love it. So you get into that app and give us a a rating or a review. I think the second OKR, if you want to get real serious, could in fact to become a member of the Moonshots podcast. Oh, well, now we're really pushing the boat out, aren't we, Mark? Mm-hmm. Because we mm-hmm. are joined by such interesting and valuable members already, some of whom have been with us for over a year, supporting the Moonshots uh, growth as well as direction that we have set ourselves. So as per Uh, Well, first of all, the way, if you're listening to us thinking, well, yeah, Mike and Mark and Bridie from the Moonshots podcast. Yeah, I I like what they're doing. I want to join up the Moonshots family. You can do so by running on over to moonshots.io and clicking on the little member button right at the top. And you will join the ranks of many, many well-known individuals by now, including our uh, annual members, Bob, Niles, John, Terry, Marjolin, Ken, and D. Etmar. But that's by no means letting down or deprioritizing everybody else. So please welcome, as usual, Marjan, Connor, Rodrigo, and Yasmin, Lisa, Sid, Mr. Bonjour, Maria, Paul, and Berg, Kalman, David, Joe, and Crystal, Evo, Christian, Hurricane Brain, and Samuela, Kelly, Barbara, Bob, and Andre, Matthew, Eric, Abby, and Hosey, Joshua, Chris, Kobe, and Damien, Deborah, Lasse, Steve, and Craig, Lauren, Javier, Daniel, and Andrew, Ravi, Yvette, Karen, and Raul. 
welcome once again, members, whether you've joined us today, yesterday, or over a year ago. Thank you for being part of the Moonshots family. There you have it. Thank you. We are so grateful for your membership, for your contribution. It really does play an important role in helping us pay some of the bills that we get (laughs) for doing this show. But we would have it no other way. We love learning out loud together. We love challenging ourselves and saying, okay, how am I going to be the best version of myself? It's like the fundamental question that we're trying to answer together. So thank you to our members. Thank you to our listeners for being part of that. And I, Mark, OKRs are a huge part in your personal, professional life of actually being the best version of yourself. So now we start to put our minds, we turn our cerebrum, we put that brain power towards making, creating, setting OKRs. So why don't we delve into the advice of Week Done, and they are going to share with us how to get those OKRs set up, how to make them become real, and how they become, to, I think, the starting point to continuous improvement. Before writing an OKR, you need a good understanding of what you want to accomplish. First, focus on your objective. Think of the potential objectives you'd like to accomplish this quarter and ask yourselves the following questions. Does the objective help achieve company goals? Is the objective inspiring? Does the objective move the company forward? Is the objective time bound? And is the objective set for the end of the quarter or for the end of the year? After asking yourself those questions, it's also important to consider what objectives are not. Objectives should not be easy. You should only expect to achieve up to two-thirds of your objective in a single quarter. If an objective is achieved well before the end of the quarter, you weren't thinking big enough. And if you don't reach anywhere near that, you may have set an annual objective instead. Objectives are not projects with subtasks. Objectives are aspirational goals which seek to improve your company. They are not one-off activities, which could be considered tasks or plans. So, if we wanted to write an objective for a company to increase the revenue, a good objective might be to achieve record third quarter revenue growth. This objective works since it's aspirational, time-bound, and helps move the company forward. An example of a bad objective would be keep making revenue. This is a bad objective as it's not time-bound, inspiring, and not forward-looking. After choosing an objective, you then need to decide on your key results. Remember, key results are the way you measure your objective. Key results should be specific, quantifiable, achievable, lead to objective grading, and be difficult but not impossible. It's also important to consider what key results are not as well. They are not binary. Key results should be numeric and updated throughout the quarter. If your key result is binary, it may be a task or plan and not a key result. Which moves us to our next point. They are not tasks to be achieved. While of course tasks and projects are important in supporting your objective, key results are metrics and should be treated as such. Some good examples of key results for a previous objective would include 1. Generate $100,000 in new revenue. 2. Reduce customer churn in the first quarter from 15 to 10%. And 3. Onboard 300 new clients. These examples are quantifiable, objectively graded, and while challenging, they should still be achievable. A bad example of a key result would be 1. Launch new business line. The key result is not numerically measurable, and it is not objectively clear how it contributes to the objective. This would be considered as a project, or could be rewritten into a separate objective. Now that we have a better grasp on what makes for a good OKR, let's run through some examples and see what is good or could be improved about each. For our first example, we have the objective, make our company go viral, with the following key results. one. Generate 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. 2. Get 10,000 new followers on Instagram. And 3. Increase organic search traffic to our website by 20%. This is a good example of an OKR. 
The objective is aspirational and moves the company forward. While the key results are numeric and objectively quantify the success of the overall objective. Bad key results for the objective would include things such as make videos for YouTube, get more Instagram followers, or improve SEO. For our next example, we have the objective design, create, and launch new product with the following key results. One, interview 50 existing customers on what they would like to see for a new product line. And two, create new product. In this case, the OKR could use some work. The objective is likely not possible to achieve in a single quarter. And while the first key result is good, the second key result is not quantifiable. We're getting into the real hows of writing and approaching good as well as a consideration of bad OKRs in this clip, aren't we? We're really getting into the guts of how you and I and our listeners can really go out and start to make OKRs, whether it's for business or personal lives. We are. And I want to say the temptation here is when you're actually making your own OKRs for either yourself, your team, or your business is to make it really complex, right? Mm, I think the temptation is could it be this simple? Yeah. And the I, answer, I, <laughs> the yeah. answer is it is. But for those of you who have ever tried to build a product or to simplify the complex, the challenge is in the simplifying prioritizing, isn't it, Mark? It's like it's mm-hmm. all about simple statements. Like I'll give you an example. My objective, improve promotional channels to generate more marketing qualified leads. Now that's a really simple objective. You're stating the the shift, right? What would be the ke- uh, key results? Well, increase email marketing, increase AdWords conversion, increase organic search conversion by specific, and that's the key word, specific measurable numbers you'd add in there mm-hmm. from 100 to 150, from 70 to 100, from 45 to 50, whatever your number is. If you have a handful of these for the business for individuals throughout the organization, throughout the team, and they all cohesively work together. They must all come out of the team's overall goal, the business's overall vision. If they cascade out like that, it's a beautiful thing. But there will be a lot of discussions of, well, is that the most important thing? Which one comes first? Do I improve this first or do I transform that? So we have cause and effect discussions, urgency versus important uh, discussions. That's where all the complexity is and what's what's the number? Any of you that are used to practicing lean startup, you you often, when you really get into lean startup, you become really really kind of focused on um, the number. And as a result, the question then becomes, well, which number is the right number to focus on? Mm -hmm. And that all comes out of this, doesn't it, Matt? Yeah, it does. It does. And I think the the important call out here, similar to to what you were just saying, is the admission that this is not the only tool in your armory. This is not necessarily replacing, uh, you know, your, your company vision or your business plan, anything like that. Instead, I think the real value from... Uh, setting or considering good personal as well as team objectives and and KRs is uh, for that guiding principle, isn't it? It's providing Mm. that focus as well as providing the, uh, similar to what we were hearing from week done, the transparency uh, across the business. And with that focus then comes the uh, relief as well as confidence that can uh, be achieved when everybody's working towards that, that same goal, isn't mm. it? So I want you to imagine uh, we were sitting at the beginning days of, of Microsoft and they had this big audacious goal, which was a computer on the desk in every home. Massive, visionary, um, audacious uh, goal that really captured the spirit of what they were trying to do. I believe that when you have a big idea like that, And then you need to go, well, what are we doing today? I believe OKRs are the bridge. So, you know, often we're all um, working towards some exciting vision, but we can very quickly all get a bit off track as to, well, what should we be doing now? Mm. So 
like a quick frame here with, with OKRs, I think this is really important things for us to go through is because we know it's a really simple structure. You have an objective and then you have three key results. Let's talk a little bit about what we think are things to watch out for, things that may get you a bit off uh, track. Okay. So I think when I reflect on, you know, I mentioned that I uh, actually was installing OKRs um, with a, a company earlier this year. And the great thing is we've just gone through the first quarter of those. So this is like a really great reference point for me. I think the the most important place to start is over the next 90 days, what are the objectives? What would we need to do over the next 90 days if we have that plan for the next nine years, right? Mm-hmm. Or that goal for the next nine years, or maybe this big, hairy, audacious goal for the next 30 years, or our vision of the what we want to transform in the world. Start with saying, okay, what do we need to do this quarter? Um, and when you write an objective, um, make sure that um, it is not too easy. But this is the trick, isn't it, Mark? But not mm-hmm. too hard, yeah. right? Because if it's too hard, what happens, Mark, when you keep setting ridiculous goals? No, I mean, talk about uh, that lack of confidence that comes with not hitting them, right? (laughs) Now, quick interesting thing on this is, do you remember in the Tim Ferriss show, we talked a lot about the fact that if you take a health transformation, say you want to get bigger and stronger or you want to cut weight, the downfall in setting your goal is often that you set way too ambitious goals. Mm. So when you do not reach them, it's very uh, uh, deflationary. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty, pretty disappointing. Here's the other thing. It's really hard to keep on track because even if you're making progress against a crazy mm. impossible goal. goal, you're like, hey, I've dropped five kilograms, but I said I wanted to lose 50, right? Mm. You're like, oh, geez, I still got a long way to go. But maybe if you said, hey, I only want to lose two kilograms this month, that might be a little easy. Push it up to four. Oh, that's Mm. okay. And you hit five, all of a sudden your reaction to that is, that's great, I'm one over. Whereas if you'd been way too ambitious, you would have said, oh, forget it, I'm never going to get there. Well, you're reminding me, Mike, of our series on happiness and this idea of setting let's call them um, ambitious, but achievable Mm. goals or even ways that you want to live your life is so important Mm. because if you, exactly like you just said, where let's use fitness as as the example, if you set yourself, I'm going to run a marathon, then you, you might only run 25 kilometers and then Mm. you're going to feel that deflation that comes with it. Instead, if you can, focus more on a uh, small, let's call them bite size mm. objectives in this case. Again, you're still pushing yourself. Otherwise there's no motivation. And I think this is really what we were digging into in the Neil Pasricha mm. um, happiness equation episode that we did. It's about achieving that in a, a timely manner so that you can feel confident and go out and go and achieve it. I think you're, you're totally right. The, yeah. And the, I think then, then, you know, once again, coming back to something we mentioned earlier is this is a continuity, a continuous iterative process, continuously learning and refining. And so I want you to, we'll come back to this great example. Let's say we want to improve nurturing process for new leads. So let's say that's a, a sales objective. Now here's the key thing you must have as a key result to increase the trial to paid conversions from five to 14%. What's beautiful about this is in the end, you're you're trying to have a successful company, but you're now starting to get laser focused on a key result. Now, I think the key nuance here with what it should be, increase the trial to uh, the the trial to paid conversions from five to 14%. The mistake that you could be tempted to, to make here is to say, we're going to send a lot more trial emails, Hmm. but that's not really a result, right? That is uh, like just an activity. The key thing here, 
the most important thing to remember is that these set of results will help you achieve this objective. So again, you want to improve the nurturing process for new leads when they come into your business. Well, result number one that we need to achieve is increasing the trial to pay conversion. Okay. And we've got specific numbers there. Now we need to receive a hundred responses to our service quality survey and prioritize improvement ideas. Increase follow-up email open rate from 14 to 45%. What is beautiful about this is you would say from those two, for example, did we receive 100 responses today or or this week? Did we Mm. go from 14% to 45%? And what this enables us to do, Mark, imagine you were on on the same sales team. We're like, oh, we only got from 14 to 18% on our Mm. open rates. We're way off. Okay. Well, maybe we should try writing a new type of headline or subject line Mm. for the emails. Okay. What have we been doing? Okay. Well, let's try this. Test and experiment. Ooh, none of those worked. (laughs) We got to try again. What is best practice? Let's go read up on this. Let's let's ask Mm. an expert. And then you start going, okay, we got 14 to 21. Now we got to get 14 to 28 and so on and so forth. But the beauty is you stay on that course because you know that key result. It's related to the other key results, which pays off on the objective. This is like the hard yards of objectives and key results is to continually come back to them because they're time bound and they are really about getting a specific outcome. And if you can't get clarity on how are we tracking on the key result? If it's open to interpretation, if, if we're all negotiating it, arguing it, then the key result was not specific enough, mm. right? Mm. That's right. That's right. And coming back to the uh, work that we were hearing from John Doerr earlier in the show as well is it's providing that, that guidance, you know, a talk about going into, in the examples that you were just sharing, going into that type of activity where you're trying to optimize, let's say a, a sales process or a, just a way of engaging your customers without having that valuable objective identified and without breaking down what those key results and, you know, how are you going to go and do it identified? You, you're standing in a very dark, confusing room. And it, it, I think it's going to be, the reactions are going to be quite subjective. You're going to be choosing something that maybe is A, a little bit easy. Maybe B, it's going to be your preference because you've done it before. Or C, it's affordable, you know, whatever that solution might be. Mm. And I think utilizing OKRs allows you to step away from your own prejudice with regards to how you might go out and solve a problem Mm. and instead installs the framework around how you can do it in a measured and prioritized way and therefore hopefully improve the results, i.e. the output Mm. that you're going to be achieving from that ultimate goal that you had. I think it really does start to frame how we can all utilize uh, a structure like this to remove the uncertainty that comes with knowing you have to do something. Maybe as John Dewar was saying earlier, spending time with his family, or maybe it's improving and nurturing the process for new leads in your business. It's removing that um, fuzz again, to use John's John's word, and allows you to focus on something that until now maybe has felt a little bit overwhelming, confusing, or complicated. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that what we've got to here is a little run through of what you should do and what you shouldn't do with your OKRs. Of course, there's a couple of great places uh, to go. I would say to you that if you are saying, oh my gosh, we totally need this. Or if that was for your team at work, maybe you're like, I want to set some OKRs for myself in my personal life. Head over to moonshots.io, go to the show notes for this show at moonshots.io and you'll get all the links to all the clips and all the tools and resources that you need for OKRs. I would honestly say to you, this is one of the greatest clarifying things that I have done for myself or for teams 
Um, this is something that just makes so much sense. And the elegance is in the simplicity, but that doesn't mean that there's not a lot of work to this. It's not a one click set and forget. This is something you'll continuously come back to something you'll continually iterate upon. And now we're going to have a listen to John Dewar, the author of measure what matters. He's chatting with Seema Verma and she's the former CMS administrator for USA's Medicare program. And she actually brought OKRs into a government agency. Yes, they actually had results and objectives. It's really true. So let's have a listen to this story of OKRs. You know, more than any other agency that I'm aware of, you deeply embrace a goal setting system, OKRs. I'd love to hear the story of both how and why you did that. When I came to CMS, I had run a small company and it was a a tiny little company. It was very easy to have alignment. You spent a lot of time with your employees. They worked personally with you on a bunch of projects. So it was easier. And then I come to this big, large, sprawling organization and there's so much going on. Um, Even just getting your arms around, what, what is everybody doing? What is everybody working on? I'd probably describe CMS as almost like a bunch of musicians. You've got the piano players here, you've got the drums over there and everybody's kind of doing their own thing. And they're great. They're making beautiful music, but they're all kind of doing their own thing. And even as a leader to come in and put your arms around, what are you doing? That that was very hard. And a lot of, I think, administrators that I've spoken to, they get focused on a few priorities. For the Obama administration, they have the Affordable Care Act. So, you know, all hands on deck. They're focused on implementing a large piece of legislation. Same thing with Part D um, and the Bush administration. So, you know, I think it's been natural that a lot of these administrations have been focused around a a huge initiative. But um, we didn't have that with the Trump administration. So it was almost thinking about putting together this agenda. We did a large listening tour where we went across the country. We talked to innovators, providers, and patients. And so we had a pretty good idea of here's all the things that I want. Here's how I want to do them. But how do you get all that done? And I remember being advised, just, you know, once you pick out three or four things that you want to get done. And I thought, well, look, I'm commuting back and forth and I'm leaving my family behind. I don't want to get four things done. I want to do everything I can in my time here to affect as much change as possible. And I'm sure this won't be the case, but I didn't want to look back at this time saying, well, I wish I would have done this and I wish I would have done that. And I'm sure I'll get to that point, but I'd like to keep that list as small as possible. So John, you know, my, uh, introduction to OKRs was this. You and I had been talking. We had never talked about OKRs. We had been talking a lot about interoperability. But I happened to be at the airport, a delayed flight, and I'm just looking at the great bestsellers and I see your book. And I was like, oh, well, I know John and I've got it. I've got some time here in the airport. So I bought the book and I started reading it. So I don't know if it was just serendipity. And I called you afterwards. um, But It was sort of a serendipity where I'm coming into this organization, I'm trying to get a lot of work done, and I don't feel like we're getting there. And I was frustrated as a leader. I wasn't getting the results that I wanted to get. Um, Happened to read the book and recognize that we needed to do something to pull the whole agency together, to have alignment, to have shared goals, to have an understanding of what we were trying to achieve and to deliver it and to deliver it in a way that was organized. You know, I didn't want to have a meeting and then say, well, where's this and where's that? So it gave us a framework in terms of trying to organize our goals, our accomplishments and holding people accountable. A framework for organization all the way through to delivery as well as accountability. It's a great clip, Mike, because we're really now hearing from an individual, SEMA, who was implementing these OKRs as a means to remove the uncertainty. As SEMA calls out, it's pretty, it's a little bit easier because when you're in a small company, mm. you see what people are working on, you can grab a cup of coffee or just a chat and you feel a little bit more maybe connected. But once that business or once the situation gets bigger and bigger, 
the uncertainty kicks in. Mm. And we've covered this idea on, on the show many, many times. And that what, what a negativity can come up through feelings of uncertainty with what your team are working on, what your uh, leaders are, and how they're managing people. What that breeds is this dissatisfaction. And what of I course. love about yeah. that clip with Sigma is she's calling out, look, we had these great big ideas, but we didn't really know how we would go and do them. We did our research. We even identified what the things were mm. we wanted to do, but it all felt a little bit overwhelming. And I love this reference that Seema makes with regards to uh, legacy. I don't want to look back at my time and wonder, oh, I wish I, I did this. And I think with regards to OKRs being a framework and a methodology to help us achieve maybe those wild objectives or those <laughs> wild things that we want to go out and do. It seems short sighted almost to not give these a go and see whether it does help you go out and achieve your teams or your individual objectives or, or goals or dreams, wouldn't you say? Yeah. And I, how neat was that metaphor? It's like, there's a bunch of musicians all off in the corner playing music, but it doesn't really work as a full orchestra. And she was using OKRs to bring people in line so that, you know, she had a full symphony, uh, mm. which is a particularly good metaphor. Um, as you mentioned, as the team grows, the disconnections begin. The bigger the team, the bigger the disconnect. So something like OKRs can work on a micro level just to set your personal objectives and goals mm. right up to expanding a huge multi thousands of people in the Medicare program were able to get on the same page with OKRs. I mean, this for me is really, I can really relate to what she was talking about. Having taken this in, into before and after moments, seeing the clarity and the relief. Um, one of the things I saw in this team that we brought OKRs into is people are, I just know what I need to do. And what that was suggestive of is prior to OKRs, they were just burning so much brain power on, is this a priority? Yeah. And if you find yourself struggling to prioritize things, it is indicative, likely indicative, that the objectives and key results are not clear to you. So if you do carry the, those moments where you're like, hmm, not 100% here, Mark, I think our advice is OKRs, right? Yeah, I, I totally agree. You know, whether you have just started a new job, whether you're in the business or whatever the situation is for um, an extended period of time, What's likely is you run into moments when you do burn and i.e. waste a lot of your bandwidth, your time, your energy on maybe chasing something that fundamentally is not going to help your overarching objective, your overarching goal. And I think without identifying these OKRs, you never, I, I don't know whether there is an easier and um, by easier, I mean um, something you can put into action pretty much straight away than OKRs. You know, it's certainly something that has helped us in the past uh, provide that level of confidence that I know I'm working towards the greater good here. Mm. I know what I'm doing is not only valuable for the business, but actually valuable for me too. You know, without being able to look forward and identify this is kind of where I want to be or where we should be. And this is how we're going to go and do it. It's also, I think, an interesting build on something that you said earlier, Mike, which mm. is a reference back to your OKRs for maybe that previous quarter. Did we achieve them? How might we tweak them for the following quarter? It yes. is this living and breathing thing, isn't it? Yeah. So, so that's the key thing. So let's say you do OKRs for three months. The key thing then is before you update your own personal OKRs is you should go back as a group and look at the company's OKRs. How do mm. we do? What do we want to change? Because, and this is a key alignment thing. If at the beginning we all came together, set the company's OKRs, and we did the first quarter and you only edit and review your personal OKRs in your own context 
and do not revisit the company's goals, what do you think happens over time? You do that three or four times and you're all off sailing in different directions, aren't you, Mark? Yeah, exactly. You're sailing off in in different directions and you're likely uh, wasting a lot of time and a lot of uh, energy and, and creating frustration amongst the team. Now, Mike, I think a great extension to this and a great build is if we hear from John Doerr just maybe one more time, closing out the show and really making the case from uh, a Googler, Sundar Pinchai, who helped work on the Google Chrome browser and how they found that the secret to success was really understanding and setting the right goals. In 2008, a Googler, Sundar Pichai, took on an objective, which was to build the next generation client platform for the future of web applications. In other words, build the best browser. He was very thoughtful about how he chose his key results. How do you measure the best browser? It could be ad clicks or engagement or rep. No, he said numbers of users, because users are going to decide if Chrome is a great browser or not. So he had this one three year long objective, build the best browser. And then every year he stuck to the same key results, numbers of users, but he upped the ante. And the first year, his goal was 20 million users and he missed it, got less than 10. Second year, he raised the bar to 50 million. He got to 37 million users, somewhat better. In the third year, he upped the ante once more to 100 million. He launched an aggressive marketing campaign, broader distribution, improved the technology, and kaboom, he got 111 million users. Here's why I like this story. Not so much for the happy ending, but it shows someone carefully choosing the right objective and then sticking to it year after year after year. It's a perfect story for a nerd like me. Now, I think of OKRs as transparent vessels that are made from the what's and how's of our ambitions. What really matters is the why that we pour into those vessels. That's why we do our work. OKRs are not a silver bullet. They're not going to be a substitute for a strong culture or for stronger leadership. But when those fundamentals are in place, they can take you to the mountaintop. I want you to think about your life for a moment. Do you have the right metrics? Take time to write down your values, your objectives, and your key results. Do it today. If you'd like some feedback on them, you can send them to me. I'm john at whatmatters.com. If we think of the world-changing goals of an Intel, of a Nuna, of Bono, of Google, they're remarkable. Ubiquitous computing, affordable health care, high quality for everyone, ending global poverty, access to all the world's information. Here's the deal. Every one of those goals is powered today by OKRs. Now, I've been called the Johnny Appleseed of, of OKRs for spreading the good gospel, according to Andy Grove. But I want you to join me in this movement. Let's fight for what it is that really matters, because we can take OKRs beyond our businesses. We can take them to our families, to our schools, even to our governments. We can hold those governments accountable. We can transform those informations. We can get back on the right track. If we can and do measure what really matters. Thank you. Well, there you go. That was his brave heart moment, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Look, I, I think this is John really closing out the show on measure what matters and the value of OKRs, isn't it? We're really, I believe, Mike, I think we've made the case as to the value that they can they can bring individuals as well as businesses, don't you think? Yeah. So where would you focus your follow-up on more personal or professional? I I think the personal, uh, my personal OKRs, but in a professional situation. So what I mean by that is uh, how I can both achieve the life I want to live outside of work, 
the, uh, you know, the fitness exercise piece, the good sleep, the relationships, but balancing a little bit with the work piece. I want to make sure I work hard. I achieve those AKRs for my business that I'm working on Mm. as well as, you know, make the most of my time and build a bit of a legacy, but it's around achieving that personal uh, element, isn't it? That's perhaps maybe just, or even more important. What about you, Mike? Where where, where are you taking this next? Well, I feel like I am like a forever student of this because sometimes it's about personal or professional goals. Sometimes it's about how they relate to the people around me. Let's say you have a partner, you should be talking about what your individual goals are and then what your relationship goals are. Mm. Uh, Same at work. Um, Then I'm always, you know, I'm still a student of transforming what is the big vision into the OKRs you know, finding those priorities. Um, you know, there is such a universe here. Um, I think that you could, this is like a book. I think Mark. this, if you look at the moonshots library, this one, I'm very tempted to put in read every year. I think you're right. I I think if these are practices that we revisit regularly and by practices, I mean, you refer back to it every quarter you revisit work with your team, as well as your, your partner, perhaps it's going to be something that we've got to dig back into and remind ourselves of annually with John Doerr, isn't it? We've got to dig back into the book and, and make sure that we're optimizing the way that we're, we're right. creating those OKRs. Yes. Yes. So I think what we have seen today is just how applicable they are <clears throat> and what an agent John Doerr really is for doing it in all parts of your life. So Mark, I think we've given ourselves and all of our members and listeners lots of homework, don't you? I, I'm amazed that even though our listeners might be listening and thinking, wow, this seems a little bit um, uh, tricky. Uh, obviously, I can see the value. The truth is, as we've heard today with, with Google, with Medicare in the US, with Intel, with reference to Andy Grove, I mean, they can be very, very simple, can't they? So. The, the practice is just beginning it today and, and referring back to them and seeing how you get on, I think. There you go. Ladies and gentlemen, members and listeners, you have your homework from Mark Pearson Freeland. I <laughs> want to thank you, Mark, for setting us that homework assignment. And I want to thank you, our members and listeners, here on show 201 of the Moonshots podcast where we dived in to Measure What Matters by John Dewar. And it started with setting goals. Yes, it's all about goals. And if you need any inspirational convincing, that's what Google, Bono, the Gates Foundation, massive agencies in the US government use. And the key thing on an OKR is make it measurable. And that's exactly what Seema Verma did in transforming the Medicare program in the United States. And if that wasn't enough, there's a guy, Sundar Pichai, now CEO of Google. He used OKRs to set very ambitious but reachable stretch goals for the Chrome browser. And that's why he's running the ship. And he knows the secret to success, which is setting the right goals. Set those goals, learn out loud, and you will truly transform yourself into the best version that you can be. And that's what we're about here at the Moonshots Podcast. That's a wrap.